Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. And we'll, we'll be reading out of chapter 9. And we'll start with verses 26 and 27. Okay, so on Sunday we began, we began a series that, that I've entitled Persons of Interest. Persons of Interest. Uh, for those of you who, who may, may not be familiar with, with that term, uh, it's used in, with, uh, most closely with uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies. If, if they're looking at someone, uh, you know, let's say if a crime has been committed or if someone is suspected to have to have criminal ties, or if someone's suspected to, uh, you know, to be linked uh, to someone that the, the authorities are investigating, they would call that person a person of interest. And so, while I'm not saying that we're all criminals, okay, <laughs> uh, uh, what I am saying is that we are persons of interest, which is to say that we are persons in which God has has taken a great interest. And I want us to get that. Tonight, so we'll we'll work through the rest of of the outline uh, tonight, trying to uh, jump off of what we began on Sunday. Uh, but I just want to make sure to to make to make that clear. And just like we sang tonight, you know, God has already shown us just how interested He is. And you know, there there's there's a lie that's been perpetrated out there and and propagated that God is simply nothing more than a watchmaker. You know, he's the, uh, he's the owner of, of Tag Heuer watches, and, it, you know, he's making those nice eco-drive watches that Eli Manning so, you know, stunningly uh, represents, and uh, although he can't represent any more playoff games, but, but there's always next year. Sorry, Giants fans. <laughs> so, uh, people believe, there are, there are some people that, that subscribe to, to the lie, really, that God is a watchmaker, that he simply has, you know, wound everything up created it, you know, uh, there was a big bang, and, and God created it, and then he just leaves it alone. And so, you know, we're left to our own devices, essentially. He's, he's uninterested uh, with the goings-on of our day-to-day -day lives. However, in Scripture, throughout the hundreds of references to God's heart, to his approach towards us, and from his people to him, we see that that's simply not true. That simply cannot be true. Like we mentioned on Sunday, in the book of Jeremiah, you know, one of the opening verses, it says, it speaks that, it, it speaks to the fact that God knew him before he was in his mother's womb, right? That he was called before the natural world even knew his name. He was already called by God to say, you are going to be someone of great influence. You are going to be someone in whom I'm going to work mightily. And that's us, guys. That's us as well. So let's read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. And the Apostle Paul writes here, Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And, and I really want to focus on, on two things specifically in this verse. We see in verse 27, it begins with him saying, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. So we touched on this uh, on, on Sunday. Uh, so please, I would encourage you to get the CD uh, of Sunday if you want to, if you want to know, you know all the stuff that, that we covered because uh, I just don't have time to go through it here. But what we were going through is just the essential uh, quality of, of discipline in the life of a believer. If you're undisciplined, you're, not, you're simply not going to be able to be used by God at a high level. Or you won't be used at a high level for very long. Because at some point, 
the lack of discipline is going to lead you into a snare. You'll, you'll fall into some kind of trap or you'll simply just become fatigued and you'll burn out. Because even with the disciplined, there are times where you feel like you're on the edge of burnout. Even with someone who has applied themselves to Bible study, to, to knowledge, to digging deeper, there are things that can cause us immense challenges. And there's, and there's big time obstacles that we have to overcome, amen? There's, there's challenges for the person who's been in the faith for 30 days, just as there's major challenges for people who have been in the faith for 30 years. And what we have to do is continue to remind ourselves that it's more important to follow God's way. And we have to continually say that in the moment, sometimes I may have to do things that I don't want to do so that I can become the person I've always wanted to be. Powerful principle there. So Paul says that I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. The word that's used there, the Greek word for discipline that's used there is hupopiadso. And that was, that was a word that was taken from the boxing world. So it gives us, uh, the, the picture that it, it paints for us is of a boxer who has been struck in the eye and the area has become bruised. So you can see the skin, you know, is blue and purple and, you know, turning all kinds of nice colors uh, because he, you know, he's been tagged big time. And, and this is something that would happen during the course of rigorous training for, for athletic competition, or in this case, you know, a boxing match. And it's something that an athlete would have to endure. So Paul is, is talking to the church at Corinth, and he knows that they would know about these kinds of things. So he uses, he uses these kinds of words to really engage the, the local people because they would have known all about this kind of stuff, and a lot of them would have maybe even been into it. And so he used this to really, to really engage them. Uh, and so it makes me think of, you know, the UFC. Anybody ever, anybody get into MMA or anything like that? It's, it's kind of replaced boxing in a lot of ways because there, there's just so many more varied attacks and scenarios that presents itself to the fighter. You know, it makes it, you know, it makes it a little more, let's say, interesting for, for the modern viewer because there's so many more ways in which you could see a win, you know, be, be, um, be achieved. And so, so tonight, I kind of want to go along that vein uh, without losing those of you who may not be as into mixed martial arts as some others. So we'll try to make sure to stay, you know, as in the middle as I can. Okay, and so later on in, in verse 27, Paul says, the reason why I am so intent on disciplining my body and telling it no when it wants to go somewhere that I haven't, cho you know, chosen for it to go or where God hasn't chosen for it to go, I make sure that my mind is not uh, being allowed to uh, be distracted by something that I don't want it to be distracted by because if I do, then he says, when I have preached to others or when I'm living out my own ministry, I myself might become disqualified. And so oftentimes when we, when we get distracted, that could present a bad example for someone who's watching us. And it's something that we, we always tell, you know, we always tell our students is that you know, whether you like it or not, uh, whether you're aware of it or not, you're being watched. You're being looked up to by someone. All right? And so there's, there's two levels to that. There's one, we want to please God, so therefore we have to be disciplining ourselves to follow his word, to follow his example, and to, and to live a life that's pleasing to him. And then the second tier is that we want to be able to encourage others because at some point they're going to be going through maybe what we just came through or they will have gone through something we're about to go through, and we're going to need to lean on each other. And isn't that the beautiful thing about a church, is that we can lean on each other. We can rejoice with each other, as well as mourn and grieve with each other. So we share in all life experiences. When one of us is, is glorified or, or something great happens to them, we can all rejoice in that. And when someone's going through a, a very difficult time, if someone's lost a loved one, or is in the process of losing a loved one, let's say, you know, then that's the perfect time for the church to rise up, rally around that person, and tell them, listen, well, while we may not have all the answers right here and now, we have God's word, and we know that he is with us, and that, and that there is a plan, there is a direction that he's trying to, that he's trying to uh, lead us in. Okay, so the word that Paul used in the last part of verse 27 for disqualified is adokimos, and 
and that means, uh, that means basically an athlete that would be declared as unfit for competition or something that does not stand up to the test that was given to it and, or it doesn't pass the test that it was put through. So like an athlete who fails to meet the minimum requirements uh, you know, in the Olympic qualifiers, let's say, you run, you run the race that, that would allow you, because you know, they're trying to whittle down by, you know, by region, then by country, who's going to make their Olympic team. They can't let everybody on there because there's a, only a certain amount of people, the very elite, that can represent the country in the Olympics. And so therefore, they have to whittle, whittle, whittle away uh, athletes that are just not up to Olympic level. And so therefore, little by little, they become disqualified. And so, and Paul was, was saying here, I want to discipline myself so that I do not become disqualified, even though, you know, uh, I'm preaching to others. I'm, I'm being brought in front of others to share God's word. If my life doesn't look anything like uh, what I'm preaching, I'm in big trouble. I may myself become disqualified, even while leading other people to Christ. But what I want to focus on more is, is not that he's necessarily saying uh, that with a lack of discipline, his faith doesn't count. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm more, I'm, I'm more wanting to focus on uh, the difference between getting it to heaven by the skin of our teeth and ha having the Lord, you know, throw the doors wide open and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come into the glory that I have for you. As opposed to someone who did just the bare minimum to eke by, right? So that's the difference. So last time, uh, on, on Sunday, I should say, we spoke about five, that, that I could tell, five major uh, stumbling blocks to developing uh, good spiritual habits. So we, we covered time can be a great obstacle to us, a disconnect with Scripture, and then we talked about three different factors of it, uh, embarrassment factor, discipline factor, and desire factor. Uh, culture clash uh, is a big obstacle that, that many of us have to, have to grapple with, and we have to decide whether or not being, being cool is something that's important, more important than being right with God. Uh, changing, having to change some things, some of the scenery in our life, the environment in which we're in, uh, the people that we associate with, sometimes those things need to go, or at least for a season, until our spirit is strengthened enough to be able to witness to, the, to those people properly, let's say. Uh, we may need to change some things we're into, and that can be a very daunting task for many of us. And then lastly, we covered distractions. So distractions are a, a reason why it can be so difficult to develop spiritual habits. Uh, and we talked about when we face even spiritual opposition, a direct attack of the enemy, as well as, you know, fighting the battle in our own mind, and uh, just a lack of focus. So when we haven't taken the time to properly develop um, our ability to concentrate, because that can cost us too, right? How many of you know when, when the bell rings and the round begins and the fighter enters, enters the octagon, they enter the ring, you have to have your eyes fixed on your opponent. But more than that, you can't always just be looking at their eyes because the eyes can fake you out. There are certain things that you have to look for that can be telltale signs a strike is coming in a certain direction, and, and we'll talk about that uh, in just, just a couple of minutes. And so on Sunday, we talked about, uh, we just illum illuminated uh, some of the obstacles that we have to overcome, and tonight I want to go through some, some ways in which we can make sure uh, to get the victory over those obstacles and to become people of discipline. You ready? Let's go. Okay. So firstly, in order to make sure that you don't become disqualified, we have to know what we're up against, right? We have to know our opponents because there's more than one. You know, the Bible says in one place that, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. However, we also, uh, there are two enemies that we are facing. So it's a handicap match, all right? <laughs> Number one, the devil is one of our opponents. So, you know, not much of a surprise to many of us here is that there is the evil spirit 
He, he is a spirit. He is real. He is after us, and he wants to take us down because he sees God's deposit in us, and he wants to make sure that he can rot that out any way that he can. And he's had, even since the time of Christ, you know, he's had two millennia plus uh, to build up his, you know, his bag of tricks and, and to refine his skills, to beef up his cunning and to, and to you know, um, to, you know hone, in, hone his craft, basically, uh, to make sure that he's, you know, doing the best job possible to make us live frustrated or at least spiritually ineffective if he can't completely take us down. He wants to render us spiritually ineffective. And so I want to go through four Four verses, uh, somewhat quickly, as, much, as quickly as we can, uh, that give us some insights into what to expect from the devil, okay? So, uh, the first one is found in John chapter 8, verse 44, and it says here that Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he, the father, sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. Pretty, pretty serious. He's, you know, he's laying down the law here big time. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. So, firstly, we see here in the next sentence that Jesus gives us some insight here. The devil is a murderer. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Okay, so that's obviously goal number one for the enemy and all of his angels that we would call demons. All those demon spirits, their goal, their number one goal is to, is to eliminate us completely so that we are not able to free our loved ones and, you know, and, see, and see all the people that we care about come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And what, what a tragic thing when, you know, when we're not able or we don't take the opportunities when they've presented themselves. So he is a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. There is no truth in him. I've, I've even, uh, I've seen some accounts of people who like to, you know, they, you know, want to pass themselves off as exorcists, basically. Uh, and, and they'll try to have conversations with, with the evil spirits and try to, you know, get in, glean information out of them. But what we see here in Scripture is that we can't trust what an evil spirit is saying because they are just filled with every ungodly thing and there is no truth in them. So we have to be extremely careful and that we definitely don't want to entertain any of those things for sure or we're putting a target on our backs uh, with even more boldness than had already been. And next, it says, when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar. The next one, for he is a liar. And the father of it. Or another translation says the father of lies. So when, you know, when we want to lie to cover, cover our tracks, when we want to lie to, uh, you know, to shield ourselves maybe from a punishment or a consequence, when we lie to, you know, self, in a self-aggrandizing way or anything like that, that's where those things are, are, are coming from. However, they're not always, you know, directly inspired by him in that sense because, you know, oftentimes we do a lot of the devil's work for him, unfortunately. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, we see it, uh, a couple other pieces of, of information about his, his character. If you, want to, if you want to use that word. Uh, and you he made alive, it says, Ephesians 2, verse 2, who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Okay, so he is called the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says that, that the earth is Satan's kingdom. However, He's the prince of the power of the air. He's not the king of the power of the air because there's only one king. He's the prince of the power of the air. So what that means is that, is that he ha has been delegated uh, some kind of authority 
or some latitude, I should more say, rather than authority, you know, to, uh, you know, to try to try to do his his work. Next, it says he's the spirit. So he's a spirit. All right, he's not a person. Um, at times, he can try to pass himself off as one. You know, sometimes the you know there could be such a demonic presence in someone's life that. They become possessed, you know, like in, you know, the movie The Exorcist and, you know, a whole bunch of others that have been made in that same vein. Uh, you know, there can be evil spirits that can, you know, try to assume your consciousness and, and you know, come on you in a big way. And, and we have to make sure that we're, we're prepared to, to, you know, fight, fight against that and to keep ourselves safe from that as well. And so it says he's, he's the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. So disobedience is what to focus on. So if we could summarize, you know, him in one word, it would be disobedience. Pride, you know, lust, all of those things could describe him because that's what caused him to go astray, thinking, thinking that God was just a mean bully and wh why do you get to be God? Why do you get to sit on that throne? You know, why can't you share? Why can't you spread the wealth around? It's better for everybody, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. Right? You can't have a revolving, revolving door of, of kings and creators of the world. That would just, that would just be complete chaos. Okay, uh, and, and lastly here, Revelations, Revelation, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 10. It says, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. And listen to this, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So Satan is the accuser of the brethren. We're told that he, he travels up and down from heaven back down here, up to heaven back down here, going before the Lord and trying to get the Lord to, um, to be simply the God of justice and try to have him forget his mercy and grace towards us. So when we mess up, there are times where the devil is before the throne of God saying, do you see, this is, this is the person that you decided to forgive? This is the person that you said you wanted to do great things in? I don't see it. And then, you know, and he's trying to work that out uh, because the Bible also uses a word, the adversary, to describe him as, uh, as you would be an adversary attorney in a courtroom. So the prosecutor and then Christ, you know, would be our defense attorney. And so we see all of these pictures give us, uh, you know, a description of who and, and what the devil is. And secondly, we need to watch out for this opponent, our own hearts. There are times in which we are drawn towards things that are not good for us, that have not been prescribed by the Lord for us to be in and be involved with, but it seems like the only thing we're thinking of, the only thing that seems to make sense at the time that we should be getting involved in, spending our time in, dwelling on, uh, you know, and, and working for. And oftentimes, those things end up in big-time problems for us. Amen? Amen. And we see here, uh, just uh, we'll go through three verses here. In Jeremiah 7, chapter 17, verse 9, we see a very clear and a very stark, uh, you know, uh, very vivid description of what our hearts can possibly go to. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Another translation says incurably sick. Thank God he's the great physician. There's no virus too big that he can't wipe out with, with one word from heaven. Praise God. And then verse 9 ends with, who can know it? Who can know it? Very strong language, right? Right? That's extremely strong and extremely clear, telling us that our own hearts can deceive us. That seems like such a foreign concept, especially in, you know, modern Western culture. You know, it's, you know, follow your heart is, you know, the feel-good message that we, that we would see everywhere. You know, love is all you need, just the blanket uh, quality or, or blanket expression of something. That's all we need. Well, w with a few qualifiers, <laughs> Right. Next, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, it says, death and life 
are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, the Bible says. And so we see here that out of what we speak, because of what we allow into our hearts, we could either be a source of death or a source of life. Right? We can, we can be a, a ladder for someone in need around us, or we could become a trap door. Next, Proverbs 25, verse 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and without walls, without protection. If we cannot find a way to discipline ourselves to get a handle on our runaway hearts, if you will, then we can find ourselves in immense trouble and defenseless and even powerless when, when we don't have our connection right with the Lord, when we're not, when we're not close to him, when, we're, when, when, uh, when there's interference on the line, we can leave ourselves open and vulnerable to those attacks and the darts of the enemy, the Bible says in one place. William Penn once said that no man is fit to command another who cannot command himself. So true. You're not fit to command someone else if you can't even, you know, control your own mind, your own heart, your own emotions. And, okay, so, so now with the, uh, with the time we have left, I want to work through uh, a couple of phases of training that an athlete would go to, go through, excuse me, in order to get themselves ready for the big fight, all right? So let's pretend you know, that we're George St. Pierre, we're getting ready, getting ready to go after the, you know, the, the middleweight champ. And what do we need to do in order to make sure that we are ready for that competition, for that elite level of competition? Excuse me. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, so numeral two, getting to the big fight. All right, so we're going we're gonna to take... We're going to take a, a, um, a trip around the gym. So first of all, when we're training, we need to make sure that we're warming up, right? We have to get going. You, we got to go from a static position, muscles are cold, every, everything is just, you know, in a state of non-motion. We got to warm ourselves up. We got to get everything limber, we got to get loose, and we got to make sure uh, that we are preparing ourselves for the intense training that's, that's about to come so that when we meet up with the intense challenger across the ring from us, we'll know how to handle ourselves, right? Excuse me. Okay, so, so firstly, we need to warm up. And in order to do this, from a spiritual standpoint, we, we need to make sure to first, as we look at uh, developing discipline, is we need to clean out the junk in your mind. And that's the blank, in your mind. Or you could call it the soul, the mind will and emotion. We have to get the things out of our head that, um, that can cause us so much confusion, that can cause us so much second-guessing of ourselves, that, and, and can cause us so much pain and, and undue stress when God has already said, if you do this, I've prescribed victory. But, but we get in our own heads, right? And we can shortchange ourselves. We can stumble over our own feet. Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are, are lovely, whatever things are of good report, and if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Spend your time thinking about those types of things. Now, now, some people take a verse like that to mean, oh, so I can't, I can't, you know, think through my problems, you know, no problem solving. Am I supposed to shut my brain off to become a Christian? That's not at all what this verse is saying or what the gospel says or what God is trying to say to us. We are not told to shut our brains off in order to be a person of faith. That's not what he's saying at all. And a lot of people, uh, especially skeptics and people who would want to have an ax to grind against God, they would claim that. Because we're saying things like, even though I don't understand 100%, I'm going to move forward in faith. They would count that as foolishness. But we would say, God has already proven himself in so many instances. 
I think I can feel comfortable trusting him in this one, right? <laughs> but not everybody can get that. Not everybody can understand that. Okay, so, uh, so we need to think on things that have virtue, that are pure, lovely, have good report, are praiseworthy, meditate, spend our time thinking about those things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Clear the junk out of your mind and focus on what we're told to in Philippians. Next, we need to make sure that we're getting a good sweat going, right? In order to warm up, we got to get, the, get that blood pumping, get the toxins out of our system. We got to clear away all, that, all the sludge, you know, get everything, get everything uh, moving. And here we see in James chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, a way in which to do that. We're told here, be doers of the word and not hearers only, because in that we will deceive ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. All right? So, so in essence, like you're looking at a facsimile. You're looking at a fake. It's just a, a reproduction. What you see in the mirror is not your actual self, right? It's, it's just a reflection of you. It's not actually you. You're the one looking at the mirror. So you're the only real one in the room at that point. <laughs> So, so if you're a hearer and not a doer, then that would make you, in essence, you know, it would be your reflection trying to live out the Christian life. And that gets, and that, uh, unfortunately, you know, that ensnares many of us, honestly. You know, we, we hear something that we can't quite wrap our arms around yet, or, or we hear something that just, you know, you know, gives us pause to think, and sometimes we choose not to take the time to actually think it through. Or sometimes we come across a question we can't answer, a spiritual question, and we stop there. And we try to just grow in all the other areas, and we just leave that one untouched. But then, but then you know, uh, we become, uh, we become uh, an awkward shape. <laughs> it could get hard to move around, right? Hard, harder to grow because we're undeveloped in one area, like a three-legged table. If you put any weight on the side of the missing leg, the table's going to fall over. So we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We need to be getting out and doing the work of the ministry, right? Behind the pulpit is about, you know, 10% of ministry. Okay, next, we need to stretch ourselves. Stretch ourselves. And Paul puts it uh, in, in just a beautiful way here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Here's his outlook. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So he's telling us there, I don't, I don't see myself as already having reached champion status. Or even if he is, you know, hold, hold, uh, holding the championship belt at the end of the fight, I don't feel like I've accomplished there everything that there is to accomplish. That would be silly, right? Because you haven't even defended it yet. If you've just, you know, if you just won the title, you, got, you know, you've won the title, great. But, you know, what are you going to do when you're at the top of the mountain? Right? Uh, and that makes me think of, of an account I, I read about people who tried to climb Mount Everest, uh, you know, a lot of times it's, you know, obviously it's incredibly difficult and it takes an incredible amount of focus and planning and preparation and even, you know, physical uh, buildup to that. And you get to the top. However, there's a certain time of day that you must start descending back down or else you're going to get caught in just absolute nasty, nasty weather. That's, you know, that's, you're not going to make it through. And, and there've been people who, who unfortunately have not left at the proper time, uh, I think it might, might even be uh, as the sun goes down, uh, it has something to do with that, but then also other, other weather factors as well. And because they did not make sure to, to start descending at the right time, they're now in a, in a huge spot of trouble trying to get down from the mountain. And so Paul is saying here, just because maybe at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm an apostle, I'm going planting other churches, God has blessed me enough to be able to have 
multiple local bodies that are, that are starting to thrive and they're starting to get built and people's lives are being changed and healed. All these great things are happening, but I don't feel like I can, you know, I can retire to Florida and, and that's it and play golf every day. But instead, here's what he does. I press toward the goal. So he's still goal setting, which is huge to discipline ourselves, right? Giving ourselves something to chase after for the prize of the upward call of God. So he's pressing forward and he's pressing upward. That's huge for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So next, after you're warmed up, you know, we got a good sweat going, we're, right, we're getting loose, things getting ready, we move over to the focus mitts, the heavy bag and then the speed bag. They all have, they all have different, uh, different things that they, that they want to develop in the fighter. And I, I want to focus more on the, on the focus mitt, for lack of a better term. <laughs> uh, so uh, with, with a focus mitt, is your, your trainer would, would give you uh, a set of combinations that he wants you to strike with uh, and a set of different patterns and things to look for and ways to move your body to train yourself on how to, how to move in the fight. To, so for instance, you know, to be elusive so your opponent doesn't have an easy target to strike at. And then also he'll tell you, you know, I want you to, you know, hit me with a, a left, then a right, and then a left uppercut, let's say. And so as he shows the mitts, then you strike. So that signifies as the opponent is presenting an opportunity, strike. But you have to keep your eyes open. We, ha- we have to make sure that we're keeping our eyes open to know when to strike, to know when it's going to land. And here's a principle uh, from the fighting world here that the highest levels can only be achieved, uh, can only be reached with technique. Just natural talent alone is not enough. When, when you're tired, when it's you know, deep into the fight, the final round even, and you're getting fatigued, it's hard to hold your hands up, it's technique that will carry you through if you've taken the time to develop it before the fight. And then obviously conditioning plays a big part, but if... If you're well-conditioned and you have poor technique, you're going to get caught because a more experienced fighter is going to see the, the holes in your technique and be able to exploit it because a, a fight is like a chess match, big time, setting people up, you know, and then taking the strikes as they present themselves, the openings. All right, so uh, in order to make sure that we're focusing on the right things and, and we're, we're uh, developing that technique properly, we need to manage our time. And we touched on this on Sunday. We need to manage our time. Don't let your time manage you. For whatever you have control over, for whatever we have control over and our power to do, we need to make sure that, for instance, uh, you know, a lot of times during the day, you'll get interrupted with something that's screaming for attention to get done, and that ends up distracting you for sometimes a very large chunk of the day, and you can't get to what you originally started on. And then you end up feeling as though you didn't, you weren't productive that day. So we have to make sure as much as we can to manage our time, to manage the interruptions. Don't let them manage you. Right? And to a certain extent, you know, uh, because of lack of planning on someone else's part, it doesn't mean there's now an emergency on your part to get that thing done if you have something that you plan to get done that needs to get done. Next, we have to No, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let me just read this here. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, it focuses on this. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And we read this on Sunday. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The days are filled with so many ways in which uh, we can falter. We can, we can uh, you know, stumbling blocks present themselves. And so we need to make sure to walk circumspectly, carefully, taking inventory of what's around us, making sure that we're stepping in the right place, uh, you know, that we're, we're taking each step, putting it on solid ground with sure footing. And then we are making sure to redeem our time, not waste it away, but that we're being productive as much as possible. There's a time to relax, and, but, then, but then there's a time to be productive as well. And we have to learn the difference. Because we need rest, but we have to be productive. In, in the spirit, I mean. And in life. So next, 
We have to know the power available. Know the power available to you. Okay? So we're not fighting against our opponents without help. We have the best helper that we could possibly ever ask for. And here's why. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, we're told, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. The Bible says in another place that nothing is impossible with God. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. That's who we have on our side. That's who we have in our corner. That's who's training us, getting us ready for this fight. So we can rest assured that we can have the victory in every phase of life, in every season of life, if we make sure that we stay focused. And sometimes we need to dig deeper than other times to do so. And next, and we'll, and we'll move as quickly as we can to get through these. Our time is growing short. Uh, next is take some time to do shadow boxing. That's where, that's where it's just you in the room. Uh, you know, you don't have to have your gloves on or anything, but you're just practicing your footwork, moving around uh, on, on the canvas, on the mat, and, and you're practicing your techniques, your combinations, uh, you're thinking of your strategy, your game plan, and you're putting all that together while you're trying to build your own conditioning to make sure that you're, uh, you know, you're looking at your technique from every angle and all of those things. And so one of the things we need to do to make our shadow boxing produce results is to be mindful of your footwork. Be mindful of your footwork. If you go to try to land a really strong haymaker punch and you don't have a good solid base from which you can really you know, twist your hips, get them into it, and really get that torque to come around with a lot of power in your shot, if you come from a weak base, you're not going to land a strong punch. It's not going to have the intended result because you didn't have the good technique going into it. And even, and even as far as being able to set yourself up uh, to duck a shot, you know, or to parry, which would be just, you know, slightly move aside as, as the strike is coming at your face to be able to parry it, just very faintly get, get around it so that you can land a counter strike very quickly while the opponent has that split second of opening because they've thrown a strike, so one of their hands has to be down at that moment, right? So we have to be mindful of our footwork. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 14, we see, we're told this. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather will be healed. Pursue peace with all people, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So where are your feet carrying you? What are you doing with the time you're given each day? How many people are you helping? How many people's lives are you, are you making that uh, better? By, by what you're doing uh, for the Lord in their lives. That's a, a great way to make sure that, that we're constantly developing ourselves is to, is to wake up with the intention of each day of helping one person even. I want to bless one person today. I want to go out of my way to do something for someone that I normally would not have to try to make someone else's life better, no matter if I get a thank you, no matter if I get a reward, or no matter if anyone sees it. And you are setting yourself up for greatness just doing that. So next, visualize and attack. Know the tricks that the enemy is going to come at you with and know how. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians.
Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians.
Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians.
Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians.
Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. Okay, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. 